Welcome everyone. Tonight's session of Conchas y Café Zine uh, is obviously live on all the different live streams that we have, including YouTube, uh, Twitter slash X. Um, we're also on Instagram Live, and that's still look like looks like it's still queuing up. But for the sake of time and all of the great poetry that is yet to come. Uh, we'll go ahead and get our, our lesson started. Tonight, as I had mentioned previously on the uh, Google class, I'll be the one leading the lesson. And, you know, if at any time you have any questions, whether that be uh, here directly on Zoom, or if you have any questions um, in any of the live streams, you're more than welcome to raise your hand, reach out. Uh, you're even welcome to unmute. So to get us going, though, as is customary of Conchas y Café, we have a quote. This quote comes from Michael Shermer, who was born on the 8th of September in the year 1954. He's an American science writer and historian of science. He's also the executive director of the Skeptics Society and founding publisher of Skeptic Magazine, a publication focused on investigating pseudoscientific and supernatural claims. Y para traducírselo, esta cita de hoy viene de Michael Shermer. Nació el 8 de septiembre en el año 1954. Es escritor e historiador de ciencia, director principal de la Sociedad de Escépticos y publicador fundador de la revista Skeptic, una publicación dedicada a la investigación de relatos pseudocientíficos y sobrenaturales. Y aquí la cita dice, Los humanos son animales, contacuentos busca patrones, y somos muy adeptos a contar cuentos sobre patrones, ya sea si existen o no. And in English, the quote is, Humans are pattern-seeking, storytelling animals, and we are quite adept at telling stories about patterns whether they exist or not. So, amigos, what do you think this this uh, is trying to tell us? What is Michael Shermer trying to, you know, in, impart on us? Like I said, feel free. You can raise your hands. You can uh, even just shout out your, your uh, answer. <laughs> Nettie? So I think the world is very chaotic. So I, coming from a place from, from empathy, I understand why some people hold some beliefs. You know, the world is chaotic. But in this fear, sometimes we believe things that are not quite accurate. Hmm. Interesting. Sometimes we believe things that are not quite accurate. Yeah, that's that's very true. Um, a hand I see from Julie. Yeah, I have to agree with Neri on that because I think we do um, sort of polarize ourselves in society at many different levels, you know, with our friends, with the things that we read, you know, it's like, it's hard for us to like go outside the boundaries of things that we don't know. Mm -hmm. or people we don't know mm -hmm. and um so that's it's you know it's easier for us to just be in a pattern or see things as patterns that sort of relate to validating our belief systems yeah that's <clears throat> that's an interesting way to phrase it you know it's a it's we use patterns to validate our belief systems i mean that's more or less what what i heard and, um, you know, I, I think that that's, that's pretty accurate. And that's also probably one of the reasons why certain stories are crafted in the way that they are to sort of reinforce our pre-existing beliefs, no? Um, Abraham? Well, I think it's just part of evolution, how we tend to look for patterns. Let's say I look for a tracks on the floor and it's, I assume it's a wolf or a tiger or so on, right? Mm -hmm. And that also develops in like, what you see in the clouds, right? You start seeing faces, you start seeing trains and so on. 
as well as people like uh, here probably they allude to it like you see a stranger coming your way maybe at night mm -hmm. and the pattern suggests like mm, uh, maybe should switch to the other side of the street you know just to be safe because you have that certain expectation that has been set by either things that you have lived or people has tell you or the information that the culture has infusing your mental being right and then you take the decision like the pattern says might as well switch to the other side mm -hmm. yeah i think that's kind of what uh Mojda is saying in the chat you know they're probably uh patterns are a kind of comfort comfort zone um which yeah i could definitely see how how that holds true you know we tend to gravitate towards the things that we know we avoid the things that we don't know, you know, the sort of experiences that we have can influence our decisions as we move forward in life. I'm hearing a lot of, you know, the, the, the pattern side. What about the storytelling side? Right? How is storytelling a, a natural part of being human? Alex added in the chat, people seek. Seeking can lead to believing as well. Seeking hope faith, love, etc. Yeah. It's a nice way to translate this or to interpret this. What about how adept we are at telling stories? Any anybody have any thoughts about that idea? Julie? Um you know, I think that we're in a storytelling society right now because of social media. Mm. And I think what's happening is that uh there isn't a lot of expansion of thought but more of a like um um like like a funnel leading down to you know a funnel that's like sort of funneling all the information that you seek out you know that's funneling down into you instead of the expansion of it you know coming out and learning a lot a lot about a lot of things mm -hmm. so it's a it's kind of a we, we're kind of living in a strange time because it's really easy for us to like put something on social media have people believe it and uh have it go out to a lot of people uh instantaneously so yeah. There's a lot more power with what we can do now than there used to be. Uh, yeah. And that's not a that's not really necessarily a good thing. Because <laughs> it takes it takes a lot of information to learn something. Yeah. Yeah, this is very true. And I think that you know your your observation of the time that we live in being kind of like a almost like a natural evolution of our storytelling power. Um but yeah, to, to what end, right? Uh, Abraham? Well, for me, it always goes back to like tuk-tuk, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> Basically saying people's gathering around a fire pit and telling how the day went, right? The dangers they encounter or the, the food that they gather, right? Like, it, which is a little different than I haven't seen animals going through that kind of storytelling as humans do we tend to spice it up a lot <laughs> <laughs> so we have been become these masters of storytelling yeah. like there, we and Luis uh and sometimes we gather and we talk about these and like yeah like before writing before like that kind of formal storytelling most likely it's like type of poetry storytelling because the rhythm of rhymes and all that stuff will help people remember what's the next line of the story, right? Like it's the easiest way to put it into a story mode, right? So the rhyming of things helps a lot. And so we have then become writers, right? And then movies and then Netflix. <laughs> and so I guess, yeah, as like humans, I give them, I give us that, like we are, we're great at storytelling. <laughs> yeah, I personally like that. Um, according to Michael Shermer, you know, we put stories even if they exist or or not, you know, like we 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 are naturally going to make up whatever we want to fit whatever we believe. And you know, the 
the thing that also I think stands out to me about this particular quote is that, you know, this is coming from a person who is the founding publisher of a magazine called Skeptic, you know, and he's the executive director of the Skeptics Society. I mean, sure, the magazine investigates pseudoscience and supernatural activity, right? But, you know, the, the fact that a person who is probably a self-proclaimed skeptic himself, you know, is talking about how we we seek patterns and how we naturally come up with stories where they don't exist. You know, I think that that, that says a lot about his his sort of mind frame when it comes to narratives and stories and, you know, what role they, they play in society. But I think it's also really important for us to understand really what what is a narrative? How, as a society, have we come to define narrative? Y a ese fin, les presento aquí, pues, la definición. So this is straight out of the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. This is what a narrative is. This is the actual definition that you'll find if you look it up. And there's obviously narrative as a noun and narrative as an adjective. And the first, you know, 1A is something that is narrated, a story or an account. Algo que es narrado, un cuento o un relato. Esa es la definición de, de narrativa como sustantivo. The second one, 1B, one a way of presenting or understanding a situation or series of events that reflects and promotes a particular point of view or set of values. So kind of what we were saying before, you know, we look for certain patterns to either create a story that reinforces our point of view or our values, whether that be as a society or as an individual. Uh, segundo, el arte o la práctica de narración. Um, y para pues no, no olvidar de, de nuestra audiencia que habla español. En particular, la narrativa aquí, como dice, es una manera para presentar o comprender a una situación o serie de eventos que refleja refleja y promueve un punto de vista o valores en particular. Y pues a eso yo creo que estábamos llegando a, a interpretar la cita. But again, I think that, you know, this 1B definition is a really important one in relation to how we should be skeptical of narrative and of stories. But there's also, you know, something very valuable to understanding what a narrative is or what it can be for us as artists, because in the end, that's really why we're here today, right? We're here to talk a bit more about how we tell stories, whether it be through poetry or through photography, which it is a very important thing for us to consider. And the adjective version of a, of a narrative, excuse me, is, you know, the, the form of a story, right? Having the form of a story or representing a story or the process of telling a story. These are some of the tools that we can begin to look at, or maybe more better said, dissect when we're looking and interpreting either poetry or photography or really any, any other form of visual art or literary art. Of course, tonight we're focusing specifically on the two poetry and photography, so we'll we'll stick more in that realm. But I do have some uh, kind of thoughts in relation to this. But hay alguna pregunta? Does anyone have any questions about how we're defining a narrative at the moment? All right, let's continue on. So the thing about narratives is that an effective narrative or an effective story, it does require what we see here, depth and dimension, aka layers. You know, we can we can talk about layers in the sense of the visual. Um, we can talk about layers in the sense of the metaphorical. But depth and dimension is ultimately, I think, the more accurate way of describing what an effective story does. Because effective stories, stories that really transmit what the author or the artist intends them to transmit, they'll they'll typically add, you know, these these elements that make us connect much more closely with the subject of the narrative. In written artwork, as you see here, we have a couple of different ways in which that happens. Depth and dimension can be added to any written work of art um, with 
some of these techniques, it's these aren't the only techniques, but these are some of the the probably most well known and the the easiest to recognize. There's narrative arc or plot, meaning you know the way in which the story is told. We usually start with what's called an inciting action. Then we'll have some exposition, which explains to us the background of why this inciting action was so important. Then um, we'll have a moment of climax where there's like a a final battle or some sort of you know moment of understanding, and then we have the denouement or resolution. Um, el arco narrativo or el argumento de un cuento is básicamente igual. In, in, sin, sin embargo, el, el cuento. You know, this is uh, the narrative arc or the plot. You know, structure is going to be fairly universal. Um, there are going to be changes in the way in which a person might introduce us to certain ideas throughout their storytelling. But if we're looking at it from like a longer point of view, that's pretty pretty much how most narrative arcs work. Character arc or el arco del personaje uh, empieza con típicamente el quiebre del statu quo. Right? Breaking in the, a break in the status quo is how we usually see our uh, hero, our protagonist, our anti-hero start, right? There's something that disrupts their everyday life. And then that forces them to either, you know, live with that disruption or cross the threshold, right? Ultimately accepting the challenge of now having to deal with this break in their status quo. A lot of stories will start that way. Uh, the easiest way to think about this is any kind of origin story for a, a superhero. Uh, then there will usually be a period of learning, whether that be through mentorship or through, you know, friendships that are made, which include, you know, alliances with other characters or other um, people that have skills to teach the, the hero. And this is generally speaking, the character arc is generally speaking the, the hero's journey. Um, the heroine's journey is similar uh, with its own kind of twists to gender identity and that kind of thing as well. But, um, you know, you'll usually see things like trials and tribulations, uh, mejoras de habilidades, y luego uh, la última batalla. You know, that, that ultimate battle, that final battle is normally going to be against the antagonist, whether that be an external force or an internal force. There's usually, in most stories that are structured in this way, there's going to be some sort of face-off, which then leads to the acceptance of this new identity and what would be probably described as an equilibrium. And then the stories will normally end with a new status quo for the character. And this equilibrium basically means that they accept every part of who they are, including their past, their present, and sometimes embracing their future. And then there's a conflict and tension. And notice here that I added, you know, the, the three most common ways in which conflict and tension are uh, shown to us in most forms of storytelling. It'll be either human versus human or man versus man, however you want to phrase that. Uh, it could also be a humanoid, you know, so it could be like, you know, a, uh, I don't know, alien race or some sort of invading uh, force from from outside. But it is still kind of like a metaphor for the man versus man kind of uh, trope. Then there's going to be, you know, human versus nature or an environmental force. You could think of something kind of like a uh, uh, any of the classic um, movies about like natural disasters, you know, the day after tomorrow or 2012, those kinds of movies would be environmental forces and how, you know, people try to cope with with those things. And then in my personal, you know, opinion, one of the, the I think, most poetic ways of, of descri describing conflict and tension is the human versus themselves, right? The, the internal uh, struggle. It's a philosophical or a spiritual conflict. So, aquí tenemos um, lo que básicamente viene siendo la, los tres, uh, yeah, the Sharknado. Sharknado. Uh, maybe that, yeah, that's probably like, you know, nature and human, and, uh, you know, but yeah, that's the one I wrote for. But, <laughs> uh, but you know, these these are the, the three average este, tipos de conflicto o tensión. Um, y como dije, para mí el más poético típicamente es 
el, el ser humano contra sí mismo. So, um, any questions so far or any observations, anything that I missed that, that you also typically see in creating depth and dimension to any kind of story? Also, don't sleep on the uh, Sharknados and the cocaine bears of the world. Oh, you have seen that one. Huh. <laughs> I haven't seen that one, but you know, like they I want to see the, 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 uh, the coke bear or what was it? Uh, cocaine bear. Yeah. It's a true story. <laughs> sort of. Uh, it happened. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> Nettie, do you have a question or comment? I have a question. Uh, it's usually with the character arc because, uh, I mean, there's a gray area between having an arc and not having an arc. And what I mean by that is what happens at the end? Does the character change at all or changes some, you know, kind of changes or it just finds himself somewhere in the middle or there's like a complete reversal? Like, hmm. what defines an arc and what doesn't? That's a good question. And it's a little bit hard to hear you, but I think I, I got what you were asking is what is the definition of a character arc? You know, sometimes you'll see character arcs where it's not the main character who changes, but everyone around them who changes and everyone around them will sometimes go through these same sort of challenges of like, you know, Uh, they'll seek guidance from someone else or they'll kind of turn their back on the protagonist and, you know, they'll, they'll by the end have a different outlook on the, uh, the overall changes of, of the environment as opposed to the changes of the individual. Um, I haven't actually watched Ted Lasso, but from what I've heard about Ted Lasso, uh, you know, that, that is the kind of the structure that they use. Um, Another example that I could think of that uses that kind of approach to character arc is uh, The Office. You know, and The Office, it's debatable on who the main character is. But, you know, for the most part, we see Michael, uh, Michael Scott, he tends to be kind of the same character all the time. And the people around him are the ones that are kind of adapting and changing, where Jim and Pam, you know, their relationship tends to be the one that is is more like the, the traditional character arc. Uh, Abraham? Well, it just, I think one of the uh, things Nery is asking as well is like, does it have to have a positive, or positive end towards the end? Uh, so the ending, basically. <laughs> yeah, that's But uh, I think the growth doesn't have to happen to the character. For example, I, I think you had mentioned this one before in another time, uh, the Scarface, which I just watched not too long ago it's like <laughs> the guy doesn't change mm -hmm. but the viewer understands the changing of like oh this is what would should have happened or you know the changes for the viewer not for the main character sometimes right or you somebody know, I... mentioned the seinfeld seinfeld as well the, the, these guys never they're the same idiots and that was part of the their plan their plan was let's continue the characters they're not going to have any growth they're mm -hmm. just going to continue being I uh, sometimes assholes sort of just find funny people, right? I like the show, but they don't change. And yeah. that was purpose. And the people that's changing is mainly us mm -hmm. by viewing them, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that would be more of the anti hero approach where the anti hero kind of uh, just turns their back on society and essentially says, you know, I don't have to change for anybody, you know? Um, The movie Scarface with Al Pacino, you know, from the 80s, that is probably one of the best representations of how an anti-hero story goes. Um, because like Abraham said, you know, we expect the hero, you know, uh, Al Pacino's Scarface to change. But by the end, Tony Montana is really the same person. He hasn't changed just the clothes that he's wearing, the amount of money that he's wearing, you know, the, or that he has like that, that's what's changed. And it's us, the audience who are now actually rooting for him, who, you know, is obviously a terrible, really fucked up person, you know? <laughs> um, so like, yeah, that's, that's a great, great example. Abraham, thank you for reminding me of that one. Um, see river wrote in the chat. Oh, wow. I like that phrasing. The people who are being changed by characters, 
that don't change are basically us, the viewers. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's that's different ways in which these these sort of notions of depth and dimension kind of uh, are presented to us through different forms of written works. Right. And obviously that translates over into film and other forms of media as well, which, you know, coincidentally, we are talking about one form of visual art. So with that, hay que seguirle. En obras de arte visual, los estratos que agregan profundidad y dim dimensión incluye sin límite a la perspectiva. So one of the first things that we use, uh, at least in, in terms of uh, visual art, is perspective, right? That adds dimension and it adds depth in a, a more literal way, right? We can talk about what Abraham shared with us before, you know, in the last lesson of the wide field of view versus a narrow field of view. You know, that's one form of thinking of perspective. Um, there would also be the angle, right? A higher angle versus a lower angle shot or, a, a, you know, painting that is painted from like the ground level or from the point of view of a child. You know, those kinds of things help us to establish a story and it helps us add a certain amount of dimension to the story that we might lose if it was more of a direct representation of what we're seeing. Y luego también hay el primer plano, el segundo plano y el tercer plano. And the use of foreground, midground, and background is especially important in um, visual art, partly because, you know, it gives you, I think, more space to create, again, that sense of depth and dimensionality. But it also is an opportunity to create conflict and tension, which is why we have here the figure to ground relationship as part of you know, these, these tools for adding depth and dimension. Uh, y obviamente también en, en uh, arte visual, sobre todo en, en fotografía, hay el contraste y la tonalidad. Right? Contrast and tonality are really important, especially in photography, because photography literally means the study of light or the capturing of light. Um, so, you know, we have things like color versus black and white, you know, and those stylistic choices that we might make, but it can also be a manipulation of light and shadow, which in the next lesson, Abraham is going to definitely get, get more into. Um, so just like a little, little teaser there. Um, but then we also have the concept of negative space or el espacio en blanco versus textures. And texturas crean no solo uh, como un tipo de, de contraste, sino también una tonalidad que nos puede atraer más. Or in some cases, textures can also kind of repulse us, depending on, you know, what it is that we are trying to get our audience to uh, to to get from the image. Um, and then framing, you know, framing kind of encompasses a lot of these other things. You know, you can choose to to frame a shot from a high angle um, while also taking advantage of light and shadow. You know, all of these things tend to work together to create whatever narrative we are trying to create through our selective uh, image that, that, we're, that we're trying to portray. And if we try to apply some of these things to photography, you know, we'll also see in a lot of ways that they also apply to poetry. Um, because poetry and photography have certain, what I call unique limitations, right? Poetry can be pretty much anything, but in our understanding of poetry in most uh, sort of areas of society, you know, we understand that poetry tends to be very short and it tends to have a very specific focus. And it's almost a hyper focus on detail, especially for us as writers who are interpreting poetry. Al interpretar la poesía, hay que tener mucho, mucha, hay que poner mucha atención en los detalles, because it's really in the details where the devil exists, as, as the saying goes. You know, the, the, the things that our audience are supposed to get are the things that we need to make sure we, we really treat with a lot of almost reverence in the work that we're creating, right? We want to elevate it. We want to make sure that people see it. Um, or that we hide it in a way that is still accessible for our audience. That's where depth and dimension come from. Right? It's from the ability 
to see on the surface as well as below the surface, understanding that a metaphor is a metaphor because it has a deeper, more substantial meaning. And that is where visual metaphor and literary metaphor kind of commingle, right? They, they share that same sort of space. So think of photography and poetry, especially when where they're working together as a form of a snapshot, right? All of these are going to be snapshots of a moment in time, a particular emotion in time, a particular way of being in time. Any questions about these ideas, these concepts in visual art and depth and dimension? Or any comments, anything that I might have missed? Do you think you could explain um, figure to ground relationship a little further? Sure. So figure to ground relationship kind of refers to figure being the subject and its relation to either the foreground, the midground, or the background. Right? We we typically talk about the three different layers in, in an image. So you know it could be uh, like think of something like the. Uh, trying to think of a famous painting like the Mona Lisa for example right the Mona Lisa its relation the figure of Mona Lisa in relation to the background is that you know it's it's centered it is uh the the female figure is centered we have the face kind of at a at the eye level um sort of centered in the frame of the of the uh, actual canvas and then it's framed itself by uh, if I remember correctly, by trees, and um, then in the background, I think we see also a uh, like a small structure. Um, so that relationship of you know the largeness of the Mona Lisa in relation to the smallness of the structure in the background and the trees, you know that's the figure to ground relationship. That per that very deliberate framing is what's helping us, the viewers, really focus on. The face of the Mona Lisa, right? That that very subtle smile that is so famous. Um, if you think of it in terms of uh, photography, it could be the way that maybe a person is uh, maybe shown in silhouette, and they're walking against a very bright background. You know, um, so that sort of relationship of you know where is your eye going? That is where you can. Um, better understand, I think, how figure to ground relationships work. And if there's a lot of clutter, then, you know, you're creating a lot of tension in the image. Does, does that kind of answer the question? Yeah, thank you so much. Sure. Uh, I saw a hand from Julie and then Abraham. So, yeah, the only thing I'm thinking is not here is uh, textures. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, texture, oh, they're, oh, they're there. Yeah. yeah. Textures are really important mm -hmm. because um, they just bring so much dimension, so much more dimension to um, a photograph. Yeah. So, yeah. And yeah. you have it. <laughs> yeah, it's there. Um, but it's also in, you know, like paintings and other forms of, uh, of visual art, too. I mean, we could think of texture also in the way that like a static screen might kind of interrupt our our viewing of a movie you know and if that's deliberate then you know that's adding a, a kind of texture to yeah to the story uh abraham oh this is for the uh, figure to ground relationship when i was studying um sketching for environment one of the things that one of the teachers told us was you know go and check movies and break down a scene put pause especially a strong scene and you still see, okay, did they put the character all the way to the back? What does that tell you? It's like amplifying the, 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 the characters is small to compare to the, the situation, right? Or maybe it's lonely, right? Or it's a big and strong, right? It depends on where you put it in the, in the stage, let's say, right? That you're making this, a movie, right? And you, where are you going to put the, the actors close to the camera, all the way to the back? maybe looking at the sunset and comparing the scale of the person to the sun. You know, all those things where you're placing your character and it could be a horse, uh, a brush or whatever, but usually we'll take it for people, right? That's a good uh, 
exercise to go check movies and put pause and see why did they decided to put this character in, in this place of the scene, right? I think it's a good exercise. Yeah. Which also ties into framing too. You know, framing is very important in visual art because, you know, you could have a figure be at the very top of the frame, right? And by being at the very top of the frame, it's implying that it's above everything else. It could be off to the side or it could be dead center. And, you know, it's about playing with our, our focus, right? Where do your eyes go? In graphic design, we call that visual hierarchy. In photography, we could call it visual hierarchy or we can call it figure to ground, right? So there's different ways in which we ultimately classify some of the same basic techniques across all the different mediums. And like I said, you could take a lot of these things and also apply them to literary work, right? Perspective is just simply point of view, right? What is the point of view of the piece of writing that we're reading? You know, is it a reliable character? Is it from a first person or is it the uh, third person omniscient, third person limited? Is it second person, right? What are the point, points of view? Um, contrast and tonality there could, could refer to things like speech and the different ways in which people speak. And it can also be, you know, maybe the the difference between the the types of characters that you have. You could have a character that is very clearly an anti-hero who goes against society and they're, you know, pitted against the character that is, uh, I don't know, maybe naive, right? And so those kinds of things will add a different level of dimension and depth to whatever work you're, you're uh, reviewing. So, you know, again, what I like to say, um, and one of the things that a very long time ago I kind of came to in terms of my own art practice was that, you know, poetry can really be a type of photography it's like literary photography it's a snapshot of a moment in time of a feeling in time and you know i at least for myself began practicing um very short poems that were specific to a moment that i might see and i would try my best to describe the moment in every single way that i could think of uh which you know sometimes it worked sometimes it didn't but you know We'll see. We'll see at least one result a little later. What is, what is this, Abraham? I was at the top of the world, king of the hill, versus there I was, an ant in the huge city. Right. So those are two very different uh, perspectives from the, the first person point of view. Right. So this is the first photo that I have actually in our handout. Um, a quick little note on all the photos that are on the handout. All of these are my personal photos, and all of these were part of a 365 project. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with what a 365 project is, it's a project where you set yourself the goal of taking a photo every single day and sharing it with the world. Um, so for a while, for, for a little while there, I was really good about it, and I was actually posting these photos to my Instagram when I first opened my Instagram account. And this is one particular photo that that I uh, that I thought might help to demonstrate at least some of the, the things that we were talking about. Yeah, it's like a photo diary, exactly. Um, so if we look at this photo here, you know, what are, what are the first things that actually draw your attention, right? What are what are some of the the maybe tools that we just covered that that you see happening within this photo? Well, I see a, a jacket or something in the back. Yeah. That's, like that's draws my attention right straight back there. Or Oh, they're pants. Yeah, they're pants. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that's dead center, right? So that would that's part of the framing for sure. Abraham? Just to break down on the terms that you mentioned before, um, mm -hmm. we, we have the framing of the container. It's yeah. kind of closing the frame. So it's interrupting the whole frame. So it kind of gives you like, oh, what's like tipping your eyes towards where the image is going. Mm -hmm. And then the container itself is guiding our eyes to the pants because those lines are going down all the way down to the pants. Yeah. And after you focus on the pants, because that's what gives you the like, oh, let me look at the, it's where my eyes is going, right? Huh? 
Then after that, I think I start looking a little bit of around and then into the textures, like mm -hmm. right? the, the terms that you mentioned, you start looking like, oh, that's fabric. This is the texture of the container, especially. I think that's where my eye tends to later go to like mm -hmm. all those lines in the metal and the painting of things. Yeah. So this one in particular, um, you know, thank you, Abraham, for for pointing that out. You know, there's obviously the guiding lines or the sight lines of the container, kind of the, the way that the perspective is drawing our eyes down this way. Um, you know, and it does bring us in some ways to the center where then we see this one unique type of fabric against, you know, this texture of the 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 container, I guess is what it was. I don't really honestly remember. Um, but then there's also, you know, the the negative space, right? We have a very white looking doorway essentially here that is basically eliminating any kind of attention that we might place to that section, right? That all plays into the framing as well. And then, of course, you know, the, the purposely keeping it in color is really to just kind of draw your attention to uh, the blue, right? There's the the sharing of the of the light blue of the jeans and then the the light blue of this container and then we also have kind of like a complementary uh sort of reddish brownish reddish kind of tone there um and then uh yeah this is i think a rock uh which is kind of kind of weird it does look like a shoe i didn't actually realize that that it is i'm almost 100 percent sure that it's a rock until I actually was preparing for this lesson. Um, but yeah, you know, it's kind of kind of an odd scene for sure. Uh, I believe I took this at, behind a restaurant. I was walking up uh, up to a restaurant from their parking lot, which was obviously behind the building. Um, so I, <laughs> it caught my attention. We'll, we'll definitely, you know, leave it at that. <laughs> Um, any other thoughts or maybe even critiques that you might have for this? Is it telling a story to you? Is it, you know, if you were to add a narrative to this, what would that narrative be? I'll pose that question to you. Who let the pants out? Out. <laughs> yeah. Somebody out there walking around with no pants. <laughs> <laughs> So I was looking up uh, perspectives, you know, that, mm -hmm. and it says um, they kind of describe what you're doing here in this photograph, mm -hmm. forced, forced perspective, because mm -hmm. you're manipulating the space, um, the way we we're we're seeing it, the size mm -hmm. and the distance of the objects. Mm -hmm. So you, you're creating a sense of scale and depth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you know. Uh, scale and depth definitely are occurring and part of part of the reason why i i would you know suggest is because of the framing right the framing is uh really making our eyes go towards that center you know we have this eve of the building there that is just kind of there it's not doing anything it's blocking our view most of our view of the of the uh sky so there's no distraction there um and instead what we have is these sight lines, like I said, that are drawing our attention to this. And what's kind of nice about this bottom one is that, you know, this line of the bottom of the container then draws our eye to this right here, which is, you know, that like weird stick that's just kind of yeah. there. Um, so, you know, it's a, uh, yeah, I just thought it, it was a good photo. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. That's one. And then let's take a look at another one here. So this is a little bit more busy, but I'd like to hear from you. What are the, the things that you see happening here in this photo? Just what would the narrative be that you imagine is, is occurring here? Somebody died? <laughs> you know, I don't know. Like uh, there's trouble. There's, you know. The fire department's there. Uh, it's in East LA, mm -hmm. um, so anything's possible. 
I mean, just like anywhere else. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. but that is true. Abraham? Well, just to emphasize, we're talking about like framing, right? I think the, the, the framing that I see in this one is just basically the rooftop. Mm -hmm. And the, it's basically give us the frame of the sky. The sky is becoming our frame. That, that kind of encapsulates the bottom. And that's kind of where our eyes go. But it definitely changes from the first photo that we saw. Because mm -hmm. the first photo we saw, just because of the perspective, all those lines are guiding our eyes to the subject, which becomes the pants. This one, it's more of a, the environment. What's I don't think, maybe the color of, of, the, of the ambulance would have made it the subject but since the background is also busy and colorful mm -hmm. it just becomes a photo about the environment not just one thing unless you want to say cnn latino 63 <laughs> <laughs> and this is a commercial <laughs> <laughs> yeah here i'm definitely pushing the concept of foreground midground and background mm. right yeah. Um, here, the foreground is making it very obvious that, you know, it's the, the fire engine EMT truck, right? The, this uh, paramedic truck, that's that's where your attention is going to go more than likely, you know, first and then secondary would be to the color blue, right? Because it's so pronounced. And that's coming from, you know, the background. Obviously, there's a sky, but then also it blends with the midground. And because the midground, this mural here, is very, very busy, you know, it's it's really drawing our attention there because of something that is actually very naturally human. It's the the recognition of patterns, right? As our uh, uh, Michael Shermer said, right? We're we're looking for a pattern that is recognizable. What is more recognizable than a human face? You know, the mural is definitely going to capture your attention because of that. And then, you know, in the very, very sort of faint background, we also have these people here, um, which, you know, may or may not draw draw your attention. But, you know, there's obviously something going on in this little section here for the person that stops and really examines the photo. So want to know what the couple is talking about? Yeah, you know. <laughs> They could just be hanging out, you know, staying out of the sun um, as they wait for the bus. Like, we don't really know. Yeah. Um, because clearly this is, you know, at least a public bench, whether there's a bus stop there or not. I'll leave that up to you because we don't see it in the photo. But I like that there is at least some level of uh, storytelling happening, especially in our chat here. Um, you know, Eric added that the uh, EMT is probably on a lunch break. Uh, so, you know, it's a nice, simple little story, which is maybe <laughs> true, um, maybe not, you know. Uh, the faces in the mural are silent witnesses of something odd. Really like that, Nettie. And the skull in the mural also sets the tone. Yeah. So, you know, the associations, yeah. right? Uh, we can start making associations. Yeah. The... So, you know, for better or worse, right? Patterns do help us get to a story whether that story exists there or not um any other observations that anyone has or comments that they'd like to make about this particular piece also i don't remember if i mentioned it or not but all of these photos were taken with an iphone um an iphone 5 if i remember correctly maybe a 3g so these can, are you taking zoom, time. can you zoom in the rim so we can see you taking the photo? <laughs> I don't know if I'll I'll show up in the room here, but let's see. Obviously, I took this from the car. So yeah, I don't I don't think you can see my car there. For anybody that uh that isn't you know familiar with the east side, this is Soto Street. Soto and Cesar Chavez. That's that that particular corner intersection. All right. So I've got one last photo here for you. And there's actually two versions of this on the handout, and we'll see why. So looking at it here as it is, 
what vibe do you get from this? What is the the feeling of the photo for you in color? A colorful jail. <laughs> activity, activity. Yeah. You know, yeah, it looks like an active space. Okay. Yeah, an active space, right? Um, <laughs> thank you, River, for for that one. That definitely made me laugh. <laughs> When I was a little kid, I probably would have agreed. I would have been like, yeah, it's jail. <laughs> <laughs> the quiet before or after the child storm. Nice. I like that, Astrid. And then Roots wrote, beat up old daycare in the hood. <laughs> Abraham? Again, like, uh, I'm going to agree with River. It feels like one of those schools that, come on, you don't have no murals. We need some coloring here. I mean, the, the playground's okay. Uh -huh. But uh, I think this one, it's more about the absence. The absence of the objects, mm -hmm. like a chair that needs somebody to sit on. This yeah. one yeah. has these toys uh, and nobody playing with them. It's like, yeah. they, 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 it's the loneliness of it, you know? Like, it's missing what the objects are meant for. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I I really appreciate that interpretation, Abraham, because, you know, this this is what you got in color, right? You got that particular vibe, that that particular sentiment, right? Um, and then, uh, OK, and River added, but it's heavy on the left, like a promise that's uncertain um, in terms of the framing. Yeah, I mean, the, the left hand side of the photo is certainly much more busy in the sense of you know we have a lot of a lot of objects there right we have uh some tree trunks in the foreground and the midground we have the um what's it called the jungle gym the slide and all of the other pieces of the of the playground and then on the right because of the absence of so much we see you know probably the the um tricycles right um so yeah there's there's definitely a bit of uh, playing around with the framing here. Uh, and then there's framing within framing too, if you want to get extra meta with this, you know, and that the fence that's there is also framing specific sections of, of the photo. Um, and then there is an Asian feeling, the tree, the squares, the wood, the architecture. Good call there, Julie. Good call. Um, a little side note, this was actually taken in Little Tokyo. And let's see, River added, the tree bark is a little vibrant, the green pops, but the walls behind are bland in front of a blue that pops more. Yeah, it's like the trees are looking over the fence, hoping to see the kids waiting for them. I like that. That's a very poetic little story that you got going on there, River. I really appreciate that. But again, you know, I think what prompted me to take this photo was exactly what Abraham said. And I do remember taking this one and very deliberately framing it in this way because of the absence, right? There was maybe something that uh, you would have expected to see that was not there. So that for me, as the author of this, as the photographer, it created a natural tension that I wanted to capture. Again, you know, just taking a quick snapshot, not using anything fancy other than just my simple iPhone. And so in my sort of hope of amplifying my original sentiment as the author of this, this is actually how I presented it to the world. So I turned it in black and white. Now, what is the difference between having it in color and having it in black and white? You know, the black and white, at least for me, creates those much starker contrasts in certain areas. And I do have to admit, I didn't originally use Photoshop to create this photo, to create this uh, black and white effect. I used an app on my phone at the time that uh, actually doesn't <laughs> exist anymore for iPhones. Um, so the, the coloration was a little bit different, but nonetheless, this is how I ended up posting it in black and white. So what do we get in seeing it in black and white? The textures stand out more. Yeah. Also like how Astrid wrote, 
in the chat. The grouping of the trikes between squares suggests maybe a child feels left out of a group. Yeah, I like that, yes. Um, and then River added, now that it's in black and white, it's way less hopeful than the first one, but way more flattened. Yeah. So here's where, you know, color versus the black and white effect, you know, for me, add that added sort of tension and conflict and maybe reinforcing the original narrative that I was going for. Abraham? I I I felt like the color uh, one, it's, and usually I tend to go for black and white because of the contrast. Yeah. But this one, because the, the objects of, of our attention are more smaller and they're, you can see them, but it, it, they don't represent as much of when you see them in color. You, you kind of give that vibe of a children's toy. The same thing with the blue of the playground. Because you here, you kind of lose the playground more than the color photo. Because yeah. it's already blocked by the tree. So without the color, it's a little harder to read it. Mm -hmm. So it kind of flattens it. The other one becomes like somebody said in the, in the messages, more layers because the colors are helping you define these features that are important in this specific photo, which are the playground. It's you're missing the play playness of it in yeah. this one, yeah. and it becomes more like well, I'm gonna say more architectural photo in this mm -hmm. way. Yeah, as you're speaking, I'm actually doing some small adjustments to the uh, to the filter here to the black and white filter. To try and bring out some of that uh, the coloration of the tricycles, but but yeah, I mean, in the end, like I said, <clears throat> I originally didn't um, I originally didn't edit this photo using Photoshop. I used an app called Picture Show uh, that used to work for iPhones. Now it doesn't doesn't work anymore. The developer, I believe, stopped stopped updating it. But uh, either way. Um, you know, the black and white for me really did help me uh, as the author of this, like I said, you know, try to add that extra emphasis of what is missing, right? What is not there. And, you know, the children not being there is is kind of what really drew my attention because of the way that, that everything was just kind of left there, you know? So I hope you all found this little review helpful because I'd like to share with you next kind of what was the result of these photos. So, you know, not all of the photos ended up being posted, um, you know, as part of the 365 project. Uh, you know, like I said, this one wasn't the one that got posted. It ended up being the, the black and white version that got posted. But <clears throat> to kind of add to this concept of, you know, creating different forms of depth and dimension. You know, imagine having this photo and then being presented with this poem right next to it. And, you know, it's kind of difficult to find poems that are pre-made, right, for, for things that are ecrastic. So I had to write a brand new one. You I know. Are, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you're, you are all the uh, first to see this this poem. So feel free to, to critique and edit because um, this is obviously a uh, first draft. Um, but do I have a volunteer that might like to read it for us? Hay alguien que se atreve a leerlo. May I? Go ahead, Neri. Okay. Oh, just, before, just before I start, I love the way you make the breaks. Like, I don't know how you do it, but the, here we go. <laughs> uh, silent playground. Where did the children go? Where have the laughs gone? Where do the minds exist that absorb molecules of words that nurture and adore the creative curiosity? of three-wheeled races and three-cycle. Derbies, the minds that know sharing, inherently before grown minds say, no, that's only yours and it's your right to earn more without remorse for what or who it hurts. Where, where did those minds go? Thank you, Nettie. 
Y en español, do I have a volunteer who would like to read it in Spanish? A ver, Abraham, te reto. I'm going, wait, wait, hold on. Okay, let's see. El patio de recreo en silencio. ¿A dónde se fueron los niños? ¿A dónde se han ido las risas? ¿En dónde existen las mentes que absorben las moléculas de palabras que crían y adoran a, los, a la curiosidad creativa de carreras de tres llantas y los derby de tricycles tri, de tricicletas o tricicletas las mentes que conocen compartir intrínsecamente antes que digan mentes creídas, crecidas, no es, no, eso es solo tuyo y es tu derecho. Ganar más sin remordimiento por el que o quien dañes, ¿dónde? ¿En dónde se han ido esas mentes? Excellent. Thank you, Eber. So, ¿cómo les parece? What do you all think of the narrative? What are some of the tools, the narrative tools that we discussed that I tried to use here that you might recognize? There's a little hint. I said one earlier that is probably the most poetic of them all. Texture of the breaks. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, River. I think that, that you the... also started um with the I, I wanna I wanna say I wouldn't say conflict, but it's like the start of the story. It's like the mm -hmm. it breaks down that there's something happening right now. It's a donde se fueron los niños, like where did the children go? That's how mm -hmm. you started, which is interesting way of putting it. And let later you start going into it. Mm -hmm. So it's action, the action element and yes. the narrative. It's like that's where you're going right away. Yeah. River also added the repetition of where, right? The word where does come up a few times. <clears throat> so adding in textures in that way, for sure. And then creating a sense of conflict, right? This tension, I would actually call it more than conflict. Just asking questions. Have you ever noticed how asking questions can immediately make people tense up? <laughs> yeah, it's like, a, it's like a mystery. It's like a mystery. You're presenting a mystery right away. Yeah. Yeah, and I was going to suggest that with, along with tension that there is a tension here perhaps between like the author and himself wondering like, you know, where in him, like where is that child within himself? Where has, where has that gone? You know, and he's sort of, or the person <laughs> is, you know, that's being, um, uh -huh. but that's what's coming out in this poem from looking at this image. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Astrid. Yeah, I mean, that is honestly one of the intentions that I had for crafting this poem was, you know, I wanted to try my best to present to you all something that really tried to focus on at least one of the three forms of conflict or tension that I described earlier. So if we go back up here, right, in written artwork, you know, obviously poetry, you can tell a story through poetry, right? You can have an inciting action. You can have a certain amount of exposition. Uh, you can definitely have a, a level of climax. And usually will end on some form of resolution in poetry. Poetry, that is narrative, can follow this structure. The poem that I wrote maybe has a little bit of that. It might also have some of the like break in the status quo and that, you know, the, the question that opens us up, right? Where did the children go? You know, that's that's challenging our idea of, you know, well, where should the children be, right? It's sort of just setting us up for a certain level of tension, which at the very end, it's it becomes, at least I hope, relatively obvious that this is a tension of the human versus the self. It's not so much about actually knowing or wanting to know where the kids are, 
but it's about you know what happened to the idea of being a child right to the to the innocence of children and how children are able to share and not be greedy you know it's at least the poem and in, in its intention is to at least comment on the value of sharing and you know the the faults of grown-ups in teaching kids to say you know what you can have everything that you want you earned it right and it's only yours without having to think about who or what you hurt to get there right so that was at least my intentions and it sounds like you know for for some of you 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 got that as well as some of the other tools and techniques that came up um abraham also uh because we're talking about like a perspective for me it gave me the perspective of the actual viewer of this scene but let's say it's not a photo somebody actually mm -hmm. looking at this playground and start to think about it so it becomes about this scene and somebody interpreting like the quote that you mentioned like we look for patterns so mm -hmm. you start looking into the the scene right mm -hmm. and then your your mind start going to these questions right and then trying to in a way answer them right yeah right yeah and i think that's where also you know i was yes i obviously you know presented you the photo first and i told you you know that this poem was written in response to this photo you know so you have that benefit but another thing to remember is that us as authors aren't going to be around forever and even if we are still alive it doesn't mean we're going to be there to explain to our audience you know the the motivations for our poetry so it is also very useful to consider those things as you write your poetry and you know the function of a title you know i could have used some sort of phrase from within here i could have used like you know molecules of words and that could have been the title too but by deliberately using this as my title i'm essentially as the author telling you this is the mind frame and this is the place in which you should be putting yourself right it's a silent playground most people would generally understand what a playground is and for it to be silent means that there is obviously an absence of play right so titles can definitely be a tool as abraham says any questions so far or other observations about the poem well if there are no questions then the only thing i have left to say is to really think about poetry and its relationship to photography as being snapshots right as i mentioned before you know the sort of limitations the the very small box in which photography can sometimes function is very similar to the very small box in which we place poetry a lot of times it's not always going to be the same you know across the the different mediums but for most people their understanding of poetry and photography is that it's a snapshot it's a brief moment in time and it's a brief experience that you're attempting to capture whether it be visually or verbally and so with that in mind your homework for this week is to photograph a location using some of the elements of depth and dimension that we talked about you can use framing you can use perspective you can definitely use black and white versus color. You know, you can uh, really try to manipulate the space in the sense of, you know, using your camera, whatever type of camera that might be, as a way to give us some sort of depth and dimension. And yes, the location can be in your house. You don't have to necessarily go outside. You know, this is something that uh, hopefully you would be able to, to do by manipulating either an open window, um, going inside or outside or shooting through a window itself. Um, so there's definitely different ways in which you can add depth and dimension using foreground, midground, and background. All of the different elements that we talked about, you can use any combination of them. Once you have that photo that you really like, then write a poem that uses conflict or tension as a technique for creating those narrative layers that we were talking about. Using conflict or tension in the sense of 
human versus human, human versus nature, or human versus self, right? Those are the three that we covered. And just to make it easier on yourself, I would suggest, you know, pick one of those three and try to generate that depth and dimension through the narrative that you write in your poem. Does anyone have any questions? Human versus bear. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> as long as it's not the cocaine bear, Abraham. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so any I, final questions? Was there I a have question? a quick question yes. about, because we didn't hear the other readers this time. I was just wondering about that. Like what happened to the readers that we were supposed to listen to this week? I thought we were going to listen to some readers. Um, no, I think you're confusing it with next week for the workshopping. Yeah, so it, after each class, we have the review of the work. And since we didn't finish, we're going to wait until the next review to fill the, those gaps. And Okay. Yeah, so next class, I mean, next week, yeah. we'll have the chance to hear the people that we didn't hear last week, plus the new ones. Plus so, the new one. Yeah. Okay. But we're gonna do so, both. Yeah. Okay. We're gonna try to. We'll see. But yeah, still, I know. we have time. No, no we'll, no by, by the time this is ends, we'll have a couple of extra weeks where we can cut up to that. But I prefer to give okay. everybody the the time so we don't have to rush anybody. Yeah. And when are we gonna have a party for the new release book? Uh, I'm actually going to send some uh, instructions to everyone using Google Classroom for the last uh, issue of Conchas y Café for us to do a, um, like a, uh, I called it a supercut, I think last time, you know, where it's a compilation of everyone recording themselves performing. And we'll be celebrating it in that way, using our social media as a way to, to highlight everyone who, who participated. But what about the poetry book? Yeah, for it for the actual um, like the physical thing, uh, it'll be available to purchase actually this weekend at the Pomona Print Art Book Fair. Oh, cool. um, so it's going to be officially launched at that at that event. It's happening this Saturday and Sunday um, at. Uh, I'm sorry, I I'm blanking on the location. Well, you you have it in all your writings, so yeah, it's in the uh, the Benton Art Museum at uh, I think it's one of the Claremont Colleges. I I can't remember. I think it's Pomona College actually. Um, is, is so it the same place we went last time. Yeah. The, oh yeah, it's the Pomona College. Yeah, the Pomona um, College Benton Art Museum. Okay. Um, so that's where the uh, the official like launch and release to the world is happening. Um, like I said, it is uh, this upcoming weekend, Saturday and Sunday. And it is uh, an event that is open and free to the public. And we'll be there tabling, selling the zines, helping to raise funds to continue offering these programs, um, this one and our others. So, yeah. If you're in the Pomona area, come on out and say hi. Um, and then as far as, uh, yeah, we'll be tabling. Um, and then as far as uh, like a in-person celebration reading, uh, we're probably going to save that for the summertime when we have the, the other uh, publications all all released. So okay, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's that's a good question. Thank you for asking, Julie. Also regarding the workshopping. So again, you know, next week we'll uh, be dedicating our time to working in breakout groups, and you will have an opportunity, hopefully, to have your work reviewed by your colleagues. Um, in order for that to work, we need everyone to uh, really kind of be on top of it and send in their work. Uh, we're going to try Friday this time. So um, if you can send your work to your cohort, to your assigned cohort by this Friday, uh, Friday night, then that should get, uh, give everyone the weekend. So Saturday, Sunday, plus Monday to uh, review your work, see the photography or and or read the poetry and come prepared to give you notes on Tuesday. After this Tuesday, if we see that there are people who are not consistently participating, then we might shift around the um, current cohorts a little bit to uh, give more people the opportunity to have their work read um, within the cohorts. So there will be probably an update after, after next Tuesday on, on who your cohort will be. 
And thank you, Abraham, for dropping the link for the Print Pomona Art Book Fair in the chat. Good luck at the fair. Yeah, thank you. And have fun, everyone. You know, take the time to explore your surroundings. Again, the photo that you take this week does not have to be out in the streets. It could be definitely within your home um, or within the exterior of your home. So it doesn't have to be anything like, you know, going out and doing uh, urban walks like like I like to do uh, for my photography. But, uh, you know, have a lot of fun, really enjoy the process and enjoy the the uh, writing afterwards. Sometimes that that can be equally as fruitful as the the photos themselves. So. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your week. Stay warm, stay safe. Take care, everybody. Hey, thanks.